Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's nine o'clock. Uh, well, it is in London. Um, for those of you who are in Bruges or somewhere else, um, it's something uh, else o'clock. Uh, but welcome to our 19th webinar uh, that we're delighted to be presenting uh, along with our friends at Bird and Bird, uh, at Alex Partners and uh, EP uh, Business uh, in Hospitality. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you today uh, to our deals or distress in for the hospitality sector. Um, what are we expecting? What are we experiencing? And we've got some great speakers lined up and a wonderful panel uh, to round off the session. So without further ado, um, we now have uh, our first hundred people having joined us. Um, and as the rest of you drip in, um, we'd like to suggest um, that you could do the first part of the program by helping us to answer some panel questions. So um, here's the poll questions and Izzy will share her screen so that we can see that. The first question is, what is the biggest financial challenge facing hotel owners or investors in 2024? So make your choice. Please answer at least one of those. Um, higher interest rates, debt refinancing, deterioration of hotel performance, inflationary pressures, the lack of equity to fund CapEx or something else. So what do you think the biggest financial challenge is facing hotel owners and investors this year? And the, the second question do you think distressed debt situations will drive deal activity in 2024? Again, a single choice. So we're asking you to tick one of yes, driven by a weak economy and higher interest rates. Yes, but only the most distressed assets forced to be sold. No, there will be widespread financial covenant waivers instead. Or not sure. You're not sure. So that's question number two. Do you think distressed debt situations will drive deal activity? And then the third question, which we'd all uh, appreciate your answers for, is what will be the main catalyst for more hotels to come onto the market in the next year? Again, choose one of the following. Improving financial performance or profit back, profitability back to 2019 levels, something like that. The need for capex or funds not available, pressure from lenders or an unwillingness to refinance, a deterioration in hotel performance or poor cash flow, uh, investor appetite driving up value, or you're not sure. So what do you think will be the main catalysts for more hotels to come onto the market in the next year? Give you a, a moment to answer that and then ask Izzy if she can share the results of our audience poll um, when enough of you have voted. So thanks for doing that. So question one, what's the biggest financial challenge? Well, 38% of you say it's going to be higher interest rates and then debt refinancing. So over two thirds of you feel it's either higher interest rates or the ability uh, to get your debt refinanced. A few of you saying uh, inflation um, and below 10%, that's pretty good. So uh, that's the, the biggest financial challenge, higher interest rates and debt refinancing. Um, so you think that uh, distressed debt situations, driving deal activity, uh, most of you, 71%, brilliant. Only the most distressed assets are going to be forced to be sold. We'll hear from Charles and uh, and, and uh, Graham shortly about that aspect, but everything else is in the, in the shadow of that. Um, only 12% of you uh, feel that uh, it will be a no on that one. And then finally, the main catalyst for more hotels to come onto the market uh, a bigger spread here. So pressure from lenders leading the charge, 31%. Investor appetite driving up value. Interesting. 
Very, very optimistic there. Um, improving financial performance, 14%. Need for CapEx, 10 Deteriorating hotel performance, 11%. And 8% of you are not sure. But hopefully by the end of this session, by the end of this webinar, uh, everybody will be sure of what the situation is going to be. So just before I start to introduce our two guest speakers this morning, um, just to remind you that at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. If you have a, uh, an inkling to ask a question, either of our speakers or of our panel, please type your question in there. Uh, please don't be anonymous. Include your name. And we will then do our best to answer the question during the course of the session. And if we can't answer it, then we will undertake to respond to you after the webinar has finished. We'll get back to you in the next few days. But do ask your questions because your questions are even more important than ours. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's very much uh, my pleasure to introduce to you um, Charles Human of HVS Hodges Ward Elliott and Graham Smith of Alex Partners to introduce the subjects to us this morning. Um, Charles is going to be speaking on the debt side, uh, on the uh, deal side, and Graham is going to be speaking on the distress side. And if Charles, you could please do us a favor and come onto our screens now um, and kick off with your presentation. Uh, look forward to hearing what both of you have got to say. And can I thank you both in advance because I'll probably forget to thank mm -hmm. you and everybody else afterwards. So uh, let's hear it on the deal side. Charles, kick us off, please. Thanks, Russell. Morning, everyone. I was, I was worried to remember that I prepared the wrong presentation. Uh, but let me just um, share my screen. <clears throat> So I'm going to set the scene with a, a, a quick run through of what's been happening in the transaction market over the last in the European transaction market over the last 12 months or so, and to give give some give our views on on, on where we we see things headed. Um, <clears throat> total volume over the course of 2023 was 10.8 billion euros across Europe, which um, is. 19% below 2022 levels and 60% below 2019 levels. And as you can see from the chart, <clears throat> some way below the long-term average, but still a fair amount higher than um, the years of the GFC and, and the years that follow that. So we, we, all, we all somewhat complain about the lack of activity, but actually it's somewhat higher than we saw in the six years from 2008 and onwards. Um, Activity was roughly split, just over two thirds single assets and just under one third portfolios. Uh, key, key themes to deals last year, um, roughly one and a half billion of trophies, single asset trophies being sold, that market being pretty much unaffected by the, by the headwinds of, in, in fact, if anything boosted, um, but certainly unaffected value wise by the headwinds of, of, of what's been going on, um, certainly benefiting from uptick in performance of, of the luxury sector, but some some notable uh, high-end uh, hotels selling at at um, strong prices, West of Paris, Six Senses Rome, Mandarin Barcelona, Richemont Geneva, for instance. Um, other key trend is uh, a very substantial amount of Iberian resorts, largely Spanish, but to some extent Portuguese, uh, two billion of, of resorts in, in Iberia selling at over 50 hotels, uh, way more than in in previous years, but very much a, a trend, uh, a strong desire to invest in the, in the Spanish resort market. And then some, some sig significant portfolios that, that transacted, which, which impacted overall numbers. So Adia are investing about 800 million euros in Spain. Um, Arch are buying the two Hoxons in London at just over 200 million pounds. And then at the end of the year, Elliot and LHC uh, investing in the Dean Hotel Group in, in Ireland. Um, so the three three key kind of themes for the uh, Spain. Spain was the market in which most funds were invested last year, over twenty five percent. So that you could pair that with about five percent in two thousand and nineteen. So a big swing towards 
investing in, in, in Southern European markets, particularly resorts. Um, last year, over 50% of total investment was invested in France and Spain collectively. UK is usually the, the most invested in market that, that came in at third um, and, and down quite a bit. <clears throat> Germany, I think for obvious reasons, because it's a, a market that's been lagging performance wise, relatively uninvested. Portugal, substantial substantial interest in that market. It's a small market, but definitely a market that's that's um, capturing interest. And then Italy, relatively slow given the amount of interest in that market, but I think it just shows <clears throat> how little, how difficult it is to to still invest in that market. UK volume um, down um, 68% on, on, on 2022 and its lowest level for, for, for really quite a long time, I believe. Um, of that, um, so just under 2 billion invested in the UK, just over half a billion in London and about half of that in the Archer transaction. So really quite low levels of um, activity in, in the UK. The other, the other key theme is uh, significantly reduced core investor activity. So the institutions buying leased hotels, <clears throat> one and a half billion roughly in total uh, over the course of last year, lowest level for, for, for some time, but very much reflecting um, core demand or core investing require, core investors requiring significantly higher cap rates, um, arguably going from sort of fours or five up to six plus. So that that sector has seen, I think, possibly the greatest value decrease over the last 18 months and, and uh, significantly less activity. Average deal sizes have reduced, which which um, uh, reflects partly the decline in values, but also just that it's been more smaller deals <laughs> on an all equity or, or without debt basis. So transaction sizes have generally decreased. This year, <clears throat> um, volume is up compared to the same, same period last year, 1.8 billion versus 1.67 billion for the first two months of the year. We've seen some some substantial transactions, uh, Mandarin in Paris, Statuto buying it again, um, and then Starwood somewhat surprising the market with its purchase of 10 hotels from uh, Edwardian at about 800 million. Um, Travelodge buying back 66 hotels. And then of course, we've got the sort of long awaited Landsec Accor Invest transaction um, shortly about to close, I think is generally the, the word on the street. Cap rates. So this 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 graph needs to be um, quite heavily caveated. This this is this is taken straight from the RCA transaction database, where relatively few cap rates are reported, and where they are reported, it's pretty much entirely on leased hotels as opposed to unleased non leased hotels. But I think the trend is 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 correct and is very relevant, and it shows that as interest rates started to rise um, early part of 2022, so did, so did hotel cap rates rising from kind of high fours to mid sixes. So an increase of at one and a half, nearly 200 basis points um, up to uh, here it shows 6.5. So I think this very much refl ref reflects to direct least hotel, but I think it's, it's relevant of the market as a whole. Um, and it it does show a plateauing. I know that, and I think that is again reflective of what's happening in the market. We are seeing with the interest rate outlook being somewhat visible. Um, we do think that cap rates have more or less um, plateaued. This this analysis is intended to show um, how performance has moved since two thousand and nineteen, and how value has moved. And, and and really this in, in a nub explains why transaction activity is relatively low and why the market is is seeing a bid ask spread which is probably as wide as it's has ever been um so the, here we've taken <coughs> properties that we've we've valued or been working on where we have p l data for 19 through to the end of 23 and i've just taken two sets of, <coughs> first of all london luxury so we all, we're all aware of very strong revenue growth in that market. 
here it shows 18% revenue, rooms, well, no, revenue, total revenue growth compared to 2019, um, with, with much of that flowing through to the bottom line. So yes, there have been inflationary pressures, but London luxury hotels are making more money in 23 than 19. So here we're saying up 8%. Arguably, cap rates haven't really moved for London, but here, just for the sake of the analysis, we've assumed that they've softened by half a point, which, which you know, total in total from a value perspective means a value decline of 3%. And I think that that's kind of in line with what we feel for London luxury is that values haven't really moved from um, from 2019. Still very, very strong demand. You compare that to the UK regions. So revenues are, are, are you know, strong top line growth. Um, revenues uh, on average, and this is taken off an average of about 25 hotels across some good regional markets. Um, revenues are 8% on 2019, but, but strong inflationary pressures pushing EBITDA into the negative, although not, you know, not, not substantially so. And then, but here we're saying 5% EBITDA drop. Cap rates, so here I'm saying 75 basis point um, softening. Many would argue that it's greater than that, but on this basis, that produces a value decline of 15% on 2019 levels. And, and what we're seeing is that plenty of investors are valuing uh, at significantly higher yields and discount rates to, to that level, which which means that they're valuing properties at greater discounts than, than 15%, hence why transaction activity is is, is tough to, to achieve right now. Um, I mean, the key, key constraints on the market, obviously, are, are, are the debt markets and the cost of capital, and it's still difficult. Base rates haven't moved. But we are seeing signs of... Um, a kind of encouragement and improvement in, in, in this area. Banks are now better able to assess risk. Base rates look to have peaked and, and, and the trend should be should be one of uh, cuts. Um, trading is, is, is relatively stable. So there does seem to be an increased willingness to lend. And there is a wider pool of lenders out there, um, uh, particularly from, from, from the alternative lenders and debt funds. Um, we are starting to see margins narrow. That's certainly what we're seeing from the the the, the, the debt, um, the refinancing and financing processes that we're running on our debt advisory side. And we're seeing kind of pockets around Europe of of lenders, um, really quite competitive, competitive um, terms being offered, particularly in Southern Europe, particularly in Spain, where uh, margins and interest rates do seem to have narrowed quite quite significantly and that i think you know again partly points to why there's so much activity in that in that market um kind of where, where do we see things going um so trading wise uh strs data is positive for for europe for january so it's most markets up um ref par wise eight percent on average over last year so generally it's it's strong top line um kind of there's a big but there in that luxury now does look to be softening we're hearing this generally from um high-end hotel clients uh, in, in in major european cities that december was softer than expected and so has january and february um so there is there does seem to be some resistance to the very strong rate increases that have been um that have been put on hotels uh, against that we're seeing group and mice business recovering uh our, our colleagues in the us are, are also seeing this this trend so the luxury in the market may be softening but the, the kind of the middle of the market full service full star mid-scale is benefiting um we're seeing um we are seeing i think we are generally seeing more activity and it's a sort of kind of meeting in the middle position if you like we're seeing strong there's clearly strong investor demand we're seeing an increased kind of realization amongst sellers that to get something sold requires a, 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 you know, a price adjustment and we are seeing that for various reasons whether it's a, a loan maturity on the horizon or or, or a, a fund maturity but we are seeing um pricing kind of coming down, not through distress, but just through a realization of, of what it takes to get a deal over the line. Um, we, we do expect to see more stress and distress. I think it's it's inevitable just because of the, the way 
the cost of debt today and the fact that it won't significantly decrease. But we don't see it on a significant scale, certainly less than what came out of the global financial crisis. Um, we expect to see more, probably more structured solutions rather than pure distress selling. There's a lot of, there's a more creative set of buyers out there today who are looking to do structured pref equity type deals. And we see, we expect to see more than that, more of that rather than kind of pure um, admin or, 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 or kind of distress selling. Um, we expect to see more core disposals. Some of the funds are likely to be net sellers this year. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see where where the kind of where the buyer pool is 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 for that and what what they're what they're pricing at. Um, I think the general expectation is for interest rate cuts at some point, hopefully in the second half of the year. We 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 definitely ex we expect to see an uptick in 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 transaction activity. Um, on, on, on over the course of the second half of the year, there is there is clearly significant pent up buyer appetite. Um, in terms of numbers, we would expect UK volume to be somewhere between three and four billion euros this year, so um, quite substantially up on last year. And Europe, we think, will probably get back to the long term average of fourteen to fifteen billion uh, euros. So again, up pretty substantially on on, on last year. Um, so we're generally pretty optimistic that things will things will um, start to to recover, we're, and we're not pessimistic that there will be uh, significant distress if we're following the title of the uh, of this uh, presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Charles. Um, just while you clear down your screen and um, Graham comes onto our screen. Um, a, a quick question for you, um, and, and I'm sorry, this is a curved ball, but it just occurred to me, um, given that the UK budget was uh, uh, presented yesterday. Uh, do you think that the impact of the UK budget will have any measurable effect on the uh, interest in the hospitality sector in the UK? That is a curve ball. Um... <laughs> No, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's, uh, uh, I don't think there's anything uh, particularly you know, directly significant or, or, or substantial to really affect um, our, our direct sector. I mean, I, I think obviously we've got an election this year and, and an election across the Atlantic. Um, and I've um, I've always heard, often heard people like you saying that Americans don't travel in, 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 in election years. And it, funnily enough, it, it, it came up in a conversation yesterday because the um i was meeting with a well-known owner of luxury hotels in london and they are seeing much less american visitation already this this year uh, and I, I find it very hard to believe that could be because of the election but it is american travel is down it seems i personally think the uk election will have very limited Im impact on yeah. on our market and i don't see much to be honest from yesterday's budget i don't think no. I, we're, we're likely to see um another mini budget i guess before the for election which now looks like it's going to be towards the end of the year that yeah, might that, that, that's that. what the morning papers are all talking about he's got more up his sleeve um but inter interestingly enough what you say uh, it is sadly a fact uh, that americans uh, don't travel as much in an election year and it, it's it's proven by the numbers um but uh, interesting um one question from our distinguished audience uh, the sh the comparisons that you showed between performance in uh, 2023 and 2019 um, were they adjusted for inflation or, or no not? no okay thanks so thanks Charles um, and over to Graham um, Graham's going to be uh, talking about distress or not and uh, we look forward to what you have to say thanks thanks Russell and uh, thanks Charles um Ross, if you can just let me know that uh, you can see my screen now. I can. Great stuff. Well, um, welcome, everybody. Good morning. So I'm uh, Graeme Smith. I head up the travel, hospitality and leisure uh, industry team at uh, Alex Partners. And um, on the uh, presentation today, I'm going to look at um, uh, some of the perspectives 
that might uh, lead us to expect uh, an increase in distressed uh, activity uh, this year. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit around the uh, the consumer backdrop, um, what's happening a little bit with um, hotel performance, how that feeds in then to the uh, the debt markets, and then conclude as to what we might expect heading into uh, the rest of 2024. So in terms of the, the overall uh, consumer backdrop, well, um, yeah, we've seen all the stories around the cost of living uh, crisis, uh, and we have seen that the, um, yeah, the spending power of the consumer has been weakened by that uh, impact uh, of inflation and uh, interest rate rises. What we've got here on the, um, uh, the left-hand side of the, the chart is data that comes from Barclays around what they've been seeing in terms of non-essential uh, spend uh, on the green line and then matching that up against uh, inflation numbers on the white line. And uh, we can see in early 22 that uh, rebound uh, in demand coming uh, from the, the removal of uh, uh, pandemic restrictions. Um, and then that then softening as inflation really started to bite uh, through the, the second half of uh, 2022. And then consistently from that point on, really that non-essential spend growth running below those levels of, uh, of inflation uh, in the market. Um, also some further uh, yeah, anecdotal and study evidence around uh, consumer intentions. Uh, certainly when we've done our consumer survey, uh, about 37% of consumers plan to spend less uh, overall in 2024 on discretional uh, items. Um, a number of people there from the ONS data showing that they do intend to reduce non-essential spend to manage cost of living challenges. Um, and an interesting one here on, on holiday makers, then um, in another survey, 85% of holiday makers plan to change uh, those, uh, their plans for trips in response to the ongoing cost of living crisis. But uh, actually, when you look at all the data, um, and uh, whether it's in January or almost recently, holiday bookings are hitting record levels. So as ever with consumer data, it's important to watch what people do and not necessarily what they say. Um, and also, as we saw in the news around essentially a, sort of a technical recession at the end of 2023 and subdued GDP uh, growth forecasts into 2024. Um, and this this economic backdrop is important. And, and this is very much focused on the UK. Charles talked more about uh, the European context. Um, but there is a lot of read across for the, uh, the European market as well. It's important for hotels because of the fact that the the long-standing link to RevPAR performance to uh, overall GDP growth, particularly on, on broader uh, UK. And we can see that, um, you know, that has tracked um, pretty closely over that period up to the pandemic. We've had then the large uh, spikes as we've locked down and then and then recovered. And uh, as we stand today, then roughly Rev Par is on average up 26% uh, compared to 2019. GDP is only up about 1.8%. So we've seen hotels that have been a net beneficiary at the top line from inflation and uh, pent up demand, uh, no growth in supply since uh, 2019. And that rising tide has really lifted all boats. But I think as we look forward now into 2024, that performance is going to be much more situation specific. Um, and also the um, the data certainly from CoStar suggests that you know, new supply will start coming back uh, onto the market uh, in 2024. So the question is, how will RevPAR growth evolve uh, through 2024 and then <clears throat> into 2025? Um, and that level of growth of RevPAR is going to be really important because what we've also seen uh, over the uh, the past few years has been this the impact of uh, of inflation and financing costs. And we've got a chart here which looks at 
uh, the black line, which is the uh, reported inflation data, the gray line, which looks at uh, wage inflation, and the green line, which shows the interest rate. But also what we plotted on this chart, which isn't talked about as much in the press, is actually the cumulative inflation that's been experienced over this period, and that's the red line. And whilst we hear in the press around um, inflation rates falling back from those extreme levels, getting down towards that 2% target, this is still inflation on inflation. And if we think about the cumulative impact of that over the period since 2019, inflation has pushed prices up by about 25% over that period, which is a huge amount in a very short space of time. We can see also in the very recent uh, past that wage inflation is now starting to outstrip general inflation. That's great for the guests, puts more money in their pockets, but obviously adds uh, operational costs onto hotels. And then the interest rate costs jumping up to 5.25%, significantly increasing that cost of debt. So yes, we've seen revenue growth coming through, but also that inflationary environment is having quite a material effect on the cost base of hotels. And on this next page, what we've looked at is what does that mean for hotel uh, performance? Um, and we've looked here on this page to uh, at an average hotel, if you like, a, um, a regional full service hotel. Of course, there's no such thing as an average hotel, but it's here just to illustrate uh, the point. And on the, the top left table, we have, uh, again, an illustrative P&L looking at what it, the position might have been in 2019 and how that may have developed through into 2023. Um, and how what we've seen is outside hotels with real pricing power, um, and Charles's data talks to this, you know, those luxury hotels in London, the cost inflation has largely offset revenue increases. On top of that, we've seen capex costs increasing, again, the impact uh, of inflation. And when you start to flow all this through, you may well have that revenue growth, but you're really holding profitability broadly steady spending a bit more on CapEx, which is leaving slightly less uh, profit there to service the interest burden. And now with interest costs really jumping up, if we look on this example, we've assumed somebody was paying 5% in 2019. Of course, people may have been paying less than that, um, but then maybe that jumps up to say 10% all in in 2023. Again, I'm sure people have um, you know, debt that's, uh, that's less than that when it rolls off the fixed rate at interest. But you can see roughly a doubling there of the interest rate costs. And when you start to factor that into stable profitability, at least very little cash flow there for shareholders or to pay down debt. And that sort of just feeds into greater business fragility, uh, less ability to, to absorb shock. And also what we might find actually is when fixed rates start to roll off, that hoteliers may actually be in breach of interest cover loan covenants. No one ever used to look at interest cover. Um, and at the bottom left of the page, we've looked at maybe what a, a basic senior debt stack may have been for this hotel. Somebody bought it for 20 million in 2019 at, at 10 times profitability, leveraged that at 60%, so about 12 million of debt. You start to cast that forward to trying to uh, refinance in 2024, then actually your interest cover becomes the limiting factor uh, on debt. And maybe that debt capacity is now only seven and a half million. So you've got a four and a half million pound debt funding gap when you look to refinance in 2024 if all you've been able to do is hold profitability steady compared to where it was in 2019. Um, when we've got um, those breaches in covenants, of course, there's many strategies to deal with that. Uh, but in the end, when you come to needing to refinance, I think this funding gap is going to be something that everyone's going to be very focused on as we head into 2024. Um, and we think this is particularly important because of what's going on in the broader debt markets. And there is a significant amount of uh, maturities coming due over the next 24 months, not only those that were scheduled, but also those maturities which have been um, pushed 
uh, into the future through amend and extend agreements. We've got some data here from, from CoStar. It's actually from the, the, the US CMBS market, but it's helpful just to illustrate um, some of those trends. And we can see um, on the dark blue uh, charts there in terms of what original maturities were, and we can see what's happened to that maturity pipeline once these extensions have been factored in. So a significant step up and the latest data they have, again, just illustratively looking at the 25 billion uh, CMBS loan refinancing pipeline for 2024, um, showing the impact of that um, standard maturities and then also the extensions. And also what we think is important is that this, this is across um, you know, US and Europe. So we've got a chart here that looks at the overall commercial real estate debt that's that's coming up for maturity over the next few years. So um, there's going to need to be a lot of capital available to um, absorb this financing need. And yeah, I've mentioned around that funding gap, there's actually been some quite interesting uh, research done on this. And this is by RCA and AEW. Again, we can kind of quibble about the accuracy of this, but I think it's, it's helpful as a, an illustrative point. When they do a similar calculation to what I did previously, they've estimated there's, there's around about a 90 billion euro funding gap over commercial real estate sectors over the next three years. Um, of that, about four and a half billion due to the uh, the hotel market. Um, and it's just not going to be practical that all of this funding gap will be uh, will be addressed. There is capital available, but the challenge often with these funding gap elements is that it can be viewed as non-returning capital. So a shareholder plugging this gap, uh, in the end, it's there to preserve their position and not driving an incremental return. So I think some uh, some difficult decisions to be uh, made by um, investors as they come up to that refinancing position. So overall, where do I think this, this leaves us? Well, you know, well-invested, well-located hotels will undoubtedly have benefited actually from inflation. They've been able to increase their rates in excess of the rise in their cost base. Um, weaker hotels, less so. So I think this is looking much more at a polarized market. You know, the, the, the consumer backdrop is is mixed. You know, it's improving. Interest rates are no longer going up, but there's still pressure on the consumer. Um, I think it's going to be important to really now look into the specifics of, um, of each situation because of the fact that um, it's going to become more of a polarized market with stronger hotels thriving and weaker ones um, suffering more from the current uh, situation. Um, and, and mainly because of this increase in the in the cost base, which put pressure on margins, the the rise in, in interest rates, the reduction in, in debt capacity that that's brought about. I think that's going to be focusing very much on that, uh, the refinancing wall and then what's going to determine uh, what type of, of deals might come to market is the willingness of, uh, of shareholders and other investors to step up and plug that um, funding gap. Um, so overall, in conclusion, I think you know, if interest rates remain high, then the real focus is going to have to be on hotels that are able to, to grow their profit margins sufficiently to offset that. Uh, because if they're not able to do that, then it's going to be that issue when debt matures and through the steady erosion of, uh, of cash reserves that may lead to more distress. Um, one final point is just thinking about the, the difference between um, the position we found ourselves in the great financial crisis, then, you know, that was a withdrawal of, um, uh, of liquidity from a market that happened very suddenly. I think we're more in a situation here with interest rates higher with inflation, that you're getting a, a, a steady withdrawal of cash from the sector, which means that any problems will take a little longer um, to uh, to bite. But what we have seen is that that position, if it is left to deteriorate uh, for too long, it's not addressed, then 
you run into problems very suddenly that then need to be dealt with. And that's what can kind of trigger quite a sudden uptick in distress uh, activity. Um, but I'm a very optimistic person. So I think actually overall, we'll probably see an increase in, in deal activity uh, on the best hotels, but also an increase on the, uh, on the distress side, uh, as I say, most likely driven by the refinancing war. Thank you. Thanks very much, Graham. And uh, what I would describe as um, optimistic fence sitting uh, <laughs> at the end there. Uh, it's very interesting. When we when we started this process a few years back um, and people were starting to see inflation playing a bigger role in the P&L account of a hotel, uh, there are a lot of people out there who hadn't experienced inflation in the past who were really worried and, 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 and old wags like me were saying, well, actually, experience shows that inflation bailout is actually quite a good thing uh, and the hotel does benefit from that uh, over time just wait and see and thank you for confirming that um it it, it would be interesting to uh to, to just get your spin uh on, on one aspect which is to say that um clearly the weaker performers are going to be the ones that that, that are uh, have historically been uh dropping off the charts and, and and so forth do you actually see um any market developing for those that are just performing as best as they can but not necessarily right down at the bottom level do you do you see that they could come under pressure uh, of distress or not yeah i mean it's it's undoubtedly at that the, the weaker end where these these pressures become more difficult to bear. I think in a, in a low interest rate environment, um, then it was quite easy to generate a, a cash on cash return with simply stable performance. Um, I think where we've had this uh, inflationary uh, impact, um, then you know that that becomes much tougher when you've got a significant rise in interest rates. But I think what will probably become important is looking at those hotels and, you know, if the capital structure can be rebased, perhaps if there's money to come in to help um, you know, to invest and, and reposition, then there could be some quite interesting value add deals to be done in, um, in that space. Um, because you know the, the overall propensity for people to travel in the UK and to stay in hotels still remains pretty robust. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's a bit of a fight for market share locally, and you you know it's typically those better invested, better run hotels, which are the ones that um, that can benefit and win out in that environment. Okay, a very quick question. Uh, from one of our audience is the illustrative example of hotel cost evolution versus revenue evolution, taking into account that energy costs have come down again. Yeah, it's interesting on energy costs. Um, notionally on the host wholesale markets, they have come down. Um, but I think what um, uh, hotels are finding uh, probably more at that, that smaller end is the, uh, the speed at which, those energy cost reductions flow through into the actual contracts that people can secure for supply. There's quite a lag uh, on that. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's not something that's felt as quite as immediately as it was felt on the way up. And I know a lot of hoteliers are uh, uh, quite frustrated with that. Indeed. Graham, thank you so much. Both Graham and Charles uh, will be providing their slides uh, so that we can circulate those to uh, all our audience. So uh, don't worry about uh, having to have made notes during their presentations. But it's now my great pleasure to uh, welcome James Salford uh, of Bird and Bird uh, to lead our panel discussion. Um, and if you think that James is in a strange location compared with everybody else, um, it's a very strange location. Um, so, James, welcome to the panel session. Thank you for moderating it. Uh, please introduce us to your panel. Hi, good morning, Russell, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks also to Graham and Charles for their presentations, which I think sets us up beautifully for this panel. I, I think the summary of their presentations is that obviously 2023 was an odd year in terms of the hotel performance was was 
extremely strong, but transactional activity was uh, challenged largely because of the interest rates. So joining me this morning to talk about whether we'll see deals or distress in 2024 is David Fatal from Fatal Hotels, Scott Wall from ProInvest, Ramsey Bancarius from Cedar Capital, Louise Gillen from Lima UK, Katie Morton Lee from NatWest, and Neil Kirk from LNR. Um, David, so if I can start by coming to you, um, interestingly on, on the sort of panel questions, so the questions we put out to the audience before this, nearly 70% thought that debt was the biggest financial challenge that was going to be facing um, the hotel industry this year. How are you finding things? Do you agree with that summary? Are, are you able to sort of secure debt and are you, are you managing the debt costs or are there other factors that are, that are challenging the business? Uh, <clears throat> hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, I think uh, this 70% is right. I mean, uh, this is the biggest challenge uh, those days. Um, but uh, yes, we, we were trying to uh, secure it and 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 uh, we try to um, do the best we can in terms uh, of uh, of uh, the debt. And um, this is uh, this is uh, challenging. But on the other hand, uh, there is some other challenges in the industry, uh, which is not uh, financial, uh, like the labor market, which is very difficult in Europe. Uh, uh, these days, um, but we overcome it. Um, in general, I think uh, the the debt uh, and the interest rate is the biggest challenge, and hopefully, we're going to see a decrease uh, in this term. Yeah, Ramsey, are you find the same on your portfolio? Is it in fact the is debt the biggest challenge? Are there other factors that you're concerned about? Uh, I, I, as David said, I think debt for us is the biggest challenge, particularly. In the UK, for example, the base rate is so much higher than Europe, so it has a much bigger impact on our UK portfolio than our European portfolio. Um, I think we're having less of an issue these days on the labor than we did a year or two ago, which is a nice, pleasant surprise. But for us, the debt and interest rate is definitely still the biggest challenge. Yeah. Okay, I, I may, maybe start. come to Katie, obviously, from the lender side. Clearly, that's the challenge for you. How are you... How are you dealing with that? Are you seeing that pain beginning to come through in your, your debt portfolio? How are you, what's the strategy for addressing those sort of challenges that the owners are facing? Thanks, James. Morning, everyone. Um, I think, look, for for us, we're, we're a high street lender, right? So we are not going to be the most aggressive lender in the market. Um, what that means is that generally our portfolio is in a pretty good place. Um, you know, where we were from a leverage perspective has actually translated into somewhere where interest, you know, is generally serviceable there or thereabouts, um, even in this increased increased rate environment. Um, I think when it the question kind of comes into its own is is on new business and actually, you know, where are those leverage levels based on where where interest rates are now? Um, and I think Graham very rightly, you know, did a really good demonstration in, in one of his slides around demonstrating that kind of funding gap. Um, and I think maybe positions that were kind of filled with just senior debt previously possibly won't be in the future. Um, and it'll be interesting to see kind of how that, that plays out. Well, it's maybe going to come to you because your, your portfolio is um, pan-European, you've got a number of deals in the UK, which obviously has the same challenge with higher interest rates, but also Europe, slightly softer interest rates, different challenges. Are you seeing any particular areas that are struggling, anything that's that's causing you concern or what, how, how do you feeling about 2024? Uh, I think not necessarily comparing the UK to Europe, but probably comparing more the major city centres with more of the regional side of things. You are seeing that the London assets, for instance, have had a really profitable year and they've done very well. And they can certainly accommodate the higher interest costs, albeit it's a lower owner's return that's resulting. But the regional ones have really suffered from um, they haven't been able to push ADRs to the same extent. So actually cost increases have hit the bottom line. And we've seen also a fall away from the discretionary spend as well. So assets which aren't room led, I think have been uh, finding things more challenging at the moment. Yeah, Neil, um, obviously you've got a, a, a broad portfolio and you, you sit on both sides of the fence. Um, 
how is, is we've talked a little bit about the challenge of market softening, and I think you know, the panel, sorry, the poll questions clearly show debt's the major concern. Any concerns about market softening? What, what are you seeing as being the big challenges in terms of in terms of the hotel industry goes we go to twenty four? Um, I think it's. I think the last question you asked the audience, where there was a wide range of views, is probably most appropriate because I think the challenges around debt are almost a cliff edge or looking at the investment profile where people were using leverage to enhance returns um, combined with cap rate compression. I think if you're looking from a pure operator perspective, as long as you hadn't over levered or you weren't coming up for a refinancing cliff, debt is something that is going to impact your cash and cash returns. But ultimately, it's not going to change your operational business. It's um, a question of how much of a return you can make and whether you can refinance an existing um, asset. In terms of the operational challenges to, I think it was Charles's point, um, or Graham's point maybe, about how inflation has grown and we've seen price rises of up to 25% um, since 2019. Revenue to date has grown substantially and alongside that inflationary growth. But what we're seeing now is a softening in growth. So let's call it a normalization of growth, maybe not a downturn, um, but we've still got that lag of the inflationary pressures on cost coming through. And it's a question of how long rate can keep up with the cost growth or when the cost growth finally comes out the market, which is not coming out as quickly as the um, revenue growth. I think someone was discussing utilities. You know, I think if you look, when people did budgets in Q3 2022, energy was at an all time high and they may have hedged because they'd still come off. When they dropped off in Q4 of last year and hugely dropped off over this winter, people may not have taken an advantage of it. It's the reverse of the, the debt cliff, but they've actually hedged for longer term. So it's managing all the movements in different cost bases. And sometimes the cost base is falling away, but you can't um, take advantage of it because you fixed the price. So I think the pressure is managing operational risks. It was easy to maybe buy distressed after the last financial crisis cut costs and hope for cap rate compression. That's all turning around and we're not going to see that. You've got to operate well um, and you've got to drive your operational returns because the debt market's not going to help you and cap rate compression is not going to help you. So we take a slightly different view because we're long-term owners and operators. And Neil, are you seeing that the, the sort of market differential that, that, um, that Charles talked about, it, London's performing very well, the regions are struggling. Obviously, you, you've, got, you've got assets in both. Are you seeing that split and obviously it's a luxury end or, or are, they, are those assets still performing extremely well? Is there any sort of softening of the market in terms of trade? I think that's probably right, but I'd say it's more for bifurcation of um, well-located, well-positioned assets versus more poorly positioned assets. So there are definitely regional markets that are still performing very strongly that are fit for purpose. There are also regional markets that are having a horrendous time, but they also had a horrendous time leading into the great financial crisis and post the great financial crisis and have never really been fixed. So I think it's it's a bifurcation of those assets that are fit for purpose, that they are either the focal point of the trip or they facilitate a business meeting a trip. And there are those assets that have struggled on, which have never been fixed. So I don't think it's as simple as saying the difference between regional and London, London obviously has a huge demand to it and the regional demand drivers are much more varied. But certain um, regional markets are still doing incredibly well and others just never recovered. And I suppose their underperformance was masked by the inability of people to travel. Um, we always see those poorer assets fall more quickly when, when the world goes pear-shaped and then they recover more quickly when the demand spreads out. But you know, the, the debt, the inflation will, you know, will make them more transparent as to how well they perform, I think. Sure. And Scott, bring, bring in your thoughts on, on sort of sure. financial challenges this year. Sure. I mean, I generally agree with Neil saying, you know, we've seen cost growth that's been substantial. And I think the one piece, especially in the UK, that, that you have to factor in as well is, is there's another minimum wage increase of 10% hitting in, in April this year. And so you have you have Revpar, as Neil said, is, is in our view normalizing as well. I, I don't think Revpar is going backwards, but if you look at STR's forecast over the next three years, it's very, very moderate growth. I think the one saving grace is while supply is coming back into the market, there's still, where, with where construction costs have gone, 
it is very hard to make new build work. So, so you're going to have still more limited supply that will continue to at least support occupancy. But with the consumer spending trends and the pressures we're seeing in credit card data um, and at various sources and minimum wage increases with Revpar kind of flattening to growing a little bit, you're still going to see pressures on pressures on bottom lines this year. Um, not not substantial, but I, again, if if it's a good hotel in a well located, well capex and well located, I think the hotel will continue to do okay and we'll be able to continue to service debt. I think the problems are going to fall, and where we're seeing, you know, the, the limited distress we've seen so far has been in assets that have that had issues, regardless of of that. Yeah. I, and I'm moving on to something we, we talked about when we had uh, sort of the prep section earlier this week, which is value. And obviously, Charles, Charles is hinting London uh, barely moved, uh, but clearly the regional figures are 15% down. And Neil, obviously, you've talked about that. I, one of the things we're aware of is that obviously, from a lending perspective, thinking about it, it's distress going to come. Many lenders only get a valuation once every year, or every, even every two or three years. So we're not necessarily seeing that coming through. Neil, I know you had some thoughts on, on those values and, and where they are. And, we discuss whether the grand 15% drop off on region is right or not, but how is that valuation going to play out? Do you think this year as, as lenders come up for, re- for revaluation? Um, I'm, I'm fairly ambivalent on that. I don't think it makes a difference. You know, lenders are now looking at um, debt servicing. They're looking at interest coverage. We saw coming out of the great financial crisis that people were looking at debt EBITDA multiples rather than LTV. Obviously LTV pays a part, but it's largely looking backwards or the nervousness of what happens. It's all about serviceability now. So I honestly can't get too excited about a valuation done for a banking purpose because it's at a point in time which is driven by maybe what we've seen in the rear view mirror. I think probably push that back to the bankers. They'd be more concerned about um, serviceability and um, covenant, um, coverage covenants rather than LTV because that LTV is what a market buyer would pay at the moment and that may be driven by debt availability or other things whereas actually when you're looking to grant debt for someone like us it's all going to be about serviceability because that LTV will change dramatically over the time that we own the asset and a a valuer will be more nervous about you know am I going to see a fall in market cap rates tomorrow rather than can I service this debt for the next five years which is I think where the banks are moving now more towards focusing on rather than slightly arbitrary LTV covenants based on slightly arbitrary valuations. Yeah, I would probably, probably great time to bring in Casey or Louise. Casey, do you want to go first and give us your thoughts? Yeah, happy to. Um, I, I mean, I think Neil's hit the nail on the head. Um, we've, I know different lenders kind of look at hotels either through a real estate lens or, or kind of a corporate cash flow lend. Um, and we are we are the latter. Um, so we've always sort of based our um, funding decisions on um, on the cash flows and on debt serviceability. So we might see some weakening in, in valuations. We've not kind of got the data to point to any trend in any particular way at this point. Um, but but yeah, the, the, it comes down to the key thing, which is, is debt serviceability. Uh, Louise, is that a challenge for refi? The valuations are chances of valuations are coming at fifteen percent down. I know you're going to look at debt value, but if you're refining a deal, does does that give you a cause for concern, or are you happy to look purely at the debt serv- uh, serviceability? And as long as that looks okay, you're just going to accept that the valuations are really just a, a function of where the investment market is. I mean, we're still um, paying attention to loan to value ratios, but in reality we can't really quote what we can get to on a maximum LTV basis because your debt quantum has been limited by your interest cover ratio. So I think, yes, you'll see um, some reductions in values, but it's not going to limit the debt that you will ultimately get. That is really driven by debt serviceability at the moment, as Neil was saying. Um, I think where you, you are seeing significant underperformance, though, there is a requirement, a trigger to call for evaluation in that period just to see if there is anything underlying that we should be more concerned about. Yeah. Scott, Dave Rando, keen to bring you in. Any thoughts on value, what you're seeing? And is that causing you it with banking or more broadly in terms of fund values, in terms of those valuations coming through, or you just held off for the time being? I mean, we're we're focused on on acquisitions at the moment, and you know we're still seeing in the market that that bid ask spread it has come down, it has come in, because um, I think owners are accepting that the values have have started to shift. 
Um, but as you could see from what Charles was showing on transaction volumes last year, that that bid ask spread was was very much a limiting factor for transactions happening in, in the marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for us, we're really we've had a busiest year last year buying hotels and we tend to have very low leverage we, because we buy underperforming hotels and we then spend quite a bit of money renovating. So actually debt has never been a big issue for us, whether we, you know, typically get 50% LTV rather than 70 or 80. So it hasn't been a big issue. It's really been the cash flow, like, you know, like Katie and Luis has said, it's really about what is this thing going to perform and putting money aside to cover potential debt service if the uh, business plan doesn't go as planned. So, it's less of an issue for us. It becomes obviously a much bigger issue when you're selling, when you're buying, where you need to, to, to have as much possibly debt as you can. But uh, so far, it's been, uh, it's been okay. Okay. Should we, uh, should we move on? Graham, interestingly, put up a, an ICR covenant at uh, 200%. I have to say, my experience is that 200% is probably um, somewhat historic. Um, probably one for the bankers here. I mean, I think ICRs have come down, certainly on the transactions I've seen. I, I think the reality is that trying to get a 200, I mean, I'm sure there will be deals out there where 200% works, but for an awful lot of deals, 200% won't work. Um, how have how have those deals that are set at 200% been dealt with? What, what are you looking at? And without sort of naming your exact lending criteria, Louise, Casey, is 200% is, uh, Scott, anyone else? Um, where are you seeing ICRs on deals in a broad range rather than nailing any particular colours to the mask? Uh, I think we've spent quite a long time looking at the back books, certainly over the course of the year as we saw those interest rate increases um, kicking in and where you'd set 2% hurdles before, that was really to tie the customer into what their business plan was um, and certainly we're comfortable at a much lower rate now. Um, that is to say, look, not so low, look, there's basically no covenant. So it's, it's, it's a position between the two. I think at the moment, we're looking at lower interest cover rates than you would like to on the basis that you are projecting that we're at the top and the interest rates are gonna start coming down. Um, and I think it has been a more flexible conversation um, but ultimately, there does need to be a solid interest cover covenant in place. It can't be without covenant. So I think there has been some discussions over the course of the year about what that profile looks like over the next two or three years, maybe as opposed to this year in isolation. And plans put in place to everybody be comfortable with a, uh, with a the right size debt within a, a specific period of time. Yeah. I, I, anyone else want to contribute on, on the ICR discussion? I think it's, um, it's an important one for people coming up for refi. I think I it, it's... Uh, go ahead, Katie. Thanks, thanks, Scott. Apologies. I, I would just echo exactly what, what Louise has said. Um, I think it's important as well. Often you kind of look at interest cover as just a straightforward EBITDA um, interest cover. But you've also got to think about, you know, what else has the cash got to actually service, right? You know, if you've got... Um, capex coming up is that fresh cash that's going to be injected from equity or is that just cash that's expected to be generated post servicing of of your debt um so yeah you've kind of got to take it all in the round and i think what, what we've seen is it, it's dependent on the business plan as well for a refinancing obviously it's dependent on the quality of the asset but on an acquisition it, it's dependent on the business plan and with a value add business plan obviously when there's a period of a capex and renovation and repositioning there'll be a lower coverage and the focus is really on where does that coverage ratio get to in year you know year three year four of the business plan and that's been really the focus that we've we've seen is ensuring that coverage ratio ramps up to an appropriate level um but but equally not not to two times at the moment with where with where things are yeah i suppose the other question which never which hasn't which flows off the ICR but isn't really addressed is where do the banks see their hedging requirements? Because with the volatility out there, we've just seen interest rates rise, fall off and rise again. You know, we talk about utilities being volatile and people locking into utilities. You can get yourself in a bit of danger by um, hedging at inappropriate levels and not benefiting from the downturn. We talk about hotels being good inflationary hedges. But if you've locked in an interest rate and the market falls and 
you know, you're still paying a higher rate doesn't help. So I think we need to also understand that the hedging strategies need to consider the volatility of interest rates at the moment as well, which creates more could create more stress for hoteliers unnecessarily. Yeah, Neil, we talked about this week that the rate's gone out 40 basis points in February. So there's been a significant shift. Dave Ramsey, any any thoughts on, on your views on hedging and interest rates? What what do you, what will you be doing on any refis this year? Will you be fixing the rates? Will you be hoping that floating rate comes down? Any any thoughts? Yeah, well, this time we were not fixing anything because we believe that uh, the market is toward uh, reducing the interest rate, so it it's not uh, good for us. But I can say that you know sixty seven percent of our loans. Uh, in general, for the top uh, company, is fixed because uh, w- when we do it, when the interest rate was very, very low, we decided to fix, and now we are enjoying it. So um, you know, sometimes you have to sort of uh, project. Let me. I don't want to say gamble, but uh, project. And uh, if your projection is uh, right, you you can enjoy. So for the moment, we believe that we are, uh, uh, you know, uh, facing a, a period where the interest rate will be reduced. So uh, we we won't fix. Great, Ram- Ramsey. Any thoughts on hedging? You know, fix, I, I, not fix? I, 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 we, we tend to be uh, we don't tend to fix interest rates because they are quite variable. It's hard when you you know would have been great. Unlike David, who is very smart to fix all of them when we could, but back then no one wants to fix them when you're that low. Uh, so it, it is a challenge. And you know, the interesting thing is when you go to whether financing or refinancing, if you go to five lenders, you will get very different viewpoints from what is the hot button for each lender, you know, which is great. I mean, we do a lot of renovations, redevelopments, and we'll have one very low LTV at a very high interest rate and or a low interest rate, and someone else we was not your typical London would give you a much higher uh, proceeds, but with different uh, nuances. So it is interesting out there. It isn't, you know, high street London would look at something one way, whereas a more aggressive uh, uh, London or someone who's kind of P who providing London will give you other solutions. So it really is interesting to, to have a discussion with a number of Londoners to see what you can do. It's not, not everyone has the same concerns or, or worries. Right. So, so I think the, the interesting story so far is that we're not concerned about values coming down from a lending perspective. Um, we're not terribly concerned about performance coming down. So it is the real challenge, I think, and it, it, funny enough, that came out in the polling question is, is how do people bridge that funding gap? I think as deals come up for refinance, I mean, clearly there will be some assets that are overgeared or massively underperforming where there will be problems. But I think the sense that we're getting from the panel, the sense certainly from the past, in my, my sense of the market is that we will see some distress, but not widespread. I guess if we're looking at that refinancing gap that Graham talked about, um, the big question is how are people going to fund that? Clearly, there'll be some investors who have got plenty of equity because put the cash in to, to sort the problem out, but there'll be a lot who are. Um, maybe Neil Scott, what, what are your thoughts? Did mayor's prep equity is that the answer? What are the challenges of doing those kind of deals to to bridge that funding gap? Yeah, I think it. it from my view it comes back to the the quality of the asset so if you have a good quality asset if there's a gap you'll you'll find a solution so there'll be a either a mez or a pref solution to or or a or a stretch stretch senior solution from some of the alternative lenders that will also do stretch senior um so but but if it's a poor quality asset that that hasn't had the right capex and is is underperforming the market it, it will struggle and it will lead to more distress and that's why i think when you know the the panel you know, the, on the, the survey questions, you know, the, the point about only the most distressed assets will be coming to market, which is, is, is that point is, is it's going to link to the quality of the asset. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, th- there's always going to be a solution. It's just a question of apportioning returns across the, the cap stack. So you had a senior debt solution and an equity solution. And if the senior debt is lowering where it can be and the equity can't step into that there's another part of the capital stack that gets filled you you just stress the deal slightly more and as scott said if it's a good deal you'll find a way to allocate appropriate returns through the cap stack if it's not a good deal there's not enough value there for people to get apportioned out yeah yeah louise katie any thoughts mayor's prep equity 
keen on those options to, to bridge the gap or is that not something you're, you're, you're terrified on? I know there's mixed views generally the learning market on that. I think, um, yeah, it does. It does come down to the the quality of the asset. It's it's a solution. It's not the solution, the only solution, and it's not the only the solution that will work in every single case. Um, we're certainly open to looking at um, you know combined solutions with senior and and mes providers or pref equity providers. Um, historically, it's not something that we've needed to do so much, um, but I I do expect that that sort of activity will increase in twenty twenty four. You know, not much to add from me either. I'm, I think I agree with both Scott and Katie that I think the, the MES solution works if there's a value add proposition. Otherwise, I think it's just masking what are issues that aren't going to quickly go away, the staffing cost increases and so on. Um, so prep equity would probably be the most relevant route. And I think investors, it would allow investors to stay in their assets rather than to divest totally and hopefully enjoy some of the, the gains at a future date. So I think we will see more of that. Yeah, I mean, the challenge obviously for MES is to actually get interest serviceability. If, given where we talked about ICRs are sitting now with interest rates, putting MES on top of that is, is enormous challenge, isn't it? And I hope for anyone on the panel who's tried to put that in, I don't know if Scott, have you got any thoughts on, on that challenge or is it comes back to if the asset's good enough, you'll, you'll get the debt in there. I think it again comes back to the asset. If it's a if it's a refinancing, yeah, obviously, I think the serviceability of the full the full cash flow of the debt payments is important. I think if it's a value add business plan, I think there'll be lenders and alternative lenders open to a to a pick instead, as long as you know there's a clear route to that being repaid. And so it it ultimately then comes down to the intrinsic value of the asset following the business plan. Okay, so so we think that's mesn equities are an option, but it's got to be the right asset. It's got to work from the funding perspective, and I, I guess that sort of brings us to the the, the the core of the thing. So the, the topic is deals or distress. So I think the summary, and please anyone on the panel correct me if, if you disagree, is that there's not going to be widespread distress. We're not going to see tons of assets coming to market because of distress. I think. A couple of questions to the panel. First, there will be some, and do you think that will be through formal insolvency proceedings, or do you think that will be through a sort of softer power of lenders leaning on borrowers to put assets on market? Um, I, I, and sorry, Don. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, it's funny you say that. After COVID, in a maybe not such a nice way, we all thought, okay, there's going to be great opportunities to buy things at a distress level, and, and zero happened. This time around, I think it's just normal cyclical inflationary pressure, higher interest rates. So there's definitely going to be opportunities. We actually, last year was our busiest year ever. And I think every single deal we did was pref equity. Uh, and they were all great assets, uh, as people mentioned. So they were just, the partners were very well off, but they didn't want to put up more capital. So they, they were allowed to stay in. We came in, provided the equity, helped with some of the work, but basically everyone stayed in and, and, and it was good. Uh, I think the, the lower down you go in the food chain where you have the quality assets aren't as good, uh, pref equity isn't, you know, it's not going to really help. The value isn't where it should be perhaps. And I think you're going to see a lot more opportunities there if those are the kind of assets you're looking for. We tend to look for the, the higher end ones who don't aren't as distressed although i'd love to find more of them they just aren't that much so we we try to do what we can whether it's pref equity or buying them at a there's definitely people's expectations of pricing has changed in the last year or two so where they wanted a huge number now they want an expensive yeah the, the reality is setting in that the world has changed and if you want to sell your assets it's got to be at a more reasonable price so i think there'll be more definitely more deals done, but not at distress levels. It's certainly not at the, the higher quality assets that, you know, I guess a lot of us tend to focus on. Yeah. David, when we come to you, what, what, what's your strategy for this year? Are you looking to try and buy, looking for distressed assets? Will you look at most prep equity investments? Where do you see the, the real opportunities in 2024? Um, I must say we were not uh, lucky with any distressed asset. Uh, on the contrary, whatever distress we took was uh, not a big uh, uh, success. But anyhow, we're not looking for a distressed asset. Uh, if it comes through, be, I mean, it's good. But but we are looking for unreformed assets, which we, with a good 
good asset in a good location, but underperform. And um, what our plan is usually to, uh, you know, renovate and, and put our knowledge in terms of operating because we are uh, owners and operating. So usually when we step in, uh, we believe we know how to um, increase rate and get a better performance. And that brings us the value, you know. Um, so uh, usually there is a reason for a distressed asset. Sometimes it's a bad management, but sometimes it's not a good enough asset, you know. So um, we, our, our philosophy is really to look for good assets in a good location, which is underperformed or under under renovated or or in a bad shape, and then we um, put some of our equity or and 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 uh, renovate and and upgrade the hotel and sometimes even double the the EBITDA. Yeah, and David, can I, obviously, your university's got assets all, all over Europe. I mean, Charles earlier highlighted the the, the, the dominance of the Spanish market. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, mainly because the ownership structure in the in the Spanish market has historically been very family driven. It hasn't got as much private equity style funding and institutional style ownership that many other European jurisdictions have, and that that's been part of the mechanic that's driven what's gone on in Spain and driven those numbers. Um, and indeed, across the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal seems to be very popular at the moment as well. It is it, looking at a broader European picture. Is there any jurisdiction you 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 see as presenting more opportunities? Um, obviously, Germany is going through a very tough economic time at the moment. Is there anywhere you're looking in particular, or will you just look across Europe at, at, at the best possible opportunities to present themselves? Um, you know, we we are opp opportunistic uh, buyers. And uh, we try to focus on the west side of Europe, of course. We're very active in 20 countries. Um, so uh, whatever we believe is an opportunity, we do. Uh, lately, we did a lot of deals in Spain. And we are facing a, you know, some deals in the Netherlands now, in Rome uh, and Italy. And, and uh, you know, so this part of uh, Europe is very uh, attractive to us. But in general, uh, we are looking at many, many deals. I mean, we get, you know, uh, you know, tens of deals every week. And, and you know, the spread of the company all over Europe uh, can, can give us the, the opportunity to really, uh, uh, you know, project what we believe in the right way. Uh, by the way, everybody talks about Germany, but we think that the, the future in Germany uh, will be bright. I mean, uh, last year was was not a good year, but this year, 2024, will be a very good year in Germany. We have close to 70 hotels in Germany, and uh, our results is great. So Germany is an opportunity as well for us. Um, th that's our philosophy. Great, thanks, David. Neil, Neil Scott, do one of you two want to give your thoughts on what, what, what are the key opportunities this year? Is it distress? Is it where, where, are, the, where are the opportunities and, and where are you looking to deploy capital? As a company, we, we still really um, like the UK and Germany. They're, they're both very, very strong markets overall. If you look at the long to medium term, they've got you know strong GDP fundamentals. Um, and 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 the industry in both countries, you know, long term should be should be strong. Um and we 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 continue to like the the gateway cities in Europe as well. We think you know some some have seen quite strong growth that you have to really kind of keep an eye on. You know the likes of of a Paris or is, you know most of Italy where the Rev Par's grown, call it fifty percent. Eighty years grown fifty percent. You have to keep an eye on on those. But we still like the fundamentals of those those type of cities as well. And we I agree with David that that Germany you know has a has a bright future still ahead of it and it has a really strong economy that will will continue to thrive over the medium to long term. Neil, any thoughts on? Uh, look, I think. I think it goes back to the bifurcation point is if there is distress, it will probably come at the lower quality, should we say lower interest end of the market. Um, and will we have, I don't know, hotels distress buying V3 for stuff that didn't get fixed in V1 and V2. So while some assets grow very quickly in the good times, they tend to fall very quickly in the bad times. So is that a good long-term strategy? Cause you're just hoping you get out at the right time. Um, so to David's point, we continue to be opportunistic. 
Um, but we try to do that on underperforming assets, same as they do. And we try and take a long-term operational view rather than just taking a cyclical point of view. Um, however, the point in the cycle will maybe take the froth out of some pricing and become more realistic, allowing longer term owners the ability to buy into assets and take time to turn them around rather than just making it a cyclical play. Great, thanks. Um, take one of the questions that's, that's come in, which is an interesting one on, on ground leases, obviously all the Vogue a couple of years ago, and many of those are still out there. Um, they were always a challenge to get debt on top of. Louise, Katie, has that changed? Will you look at funding ground rent deals or, or are they out of the picture in the, in the current environment? I think there is a probably out of the picture for the for this period. I mean, there's very, there's different ground rents, aren't there? You can't get away from it in some uh, central London, but the ones where it is financially engineering, bringing ground rent funds as opposed to equity, I don't think are particularly relevant at the current time for it. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we've never been particularly keen on ground rents, um, and actually, you know, whatever appetite we did have um is is has probably lessened um given where we are now great so uh, we're running a little bit short on time so final question to each of you um 2024 what are your thoughts on hotel trading performance are you pessimistic optimistic or some sort of negative it'll sort of trade out and, and similarly transactional activity do you think we will see a, a booming year in terms of that maybe start with david what are, you, what are your views on 2024 um, I think it will be a, a good year. I mean, uh, uh, in terms of of uh, uh, transaction, we see a lot of uh, transaction uh, going on. But uh, you know that the the main thing is the is the quality of the transaction. I mean, the the there are so many uh, hotels that try to, to you know to try uh, that on the market, but. But the quality. So, in terms of quality asset, I believe it will be a, a good year, and uh, we can see a lot of quality asset coming into the market. And um, yeah, and on the other hand, you know, the lenders are more appetite the app to 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 lend. So, you know, these two th things will bring uh, uh, more deals to the market. And we must say that uh, you know uh, i i believe that uh, uh, demand will be uh, in the coming 2 3 years will be uh, higher than the supply of hotels coming into the market uh, we we can see that the, the percentage of uh, supply of hotels is much lower than uh, years before covid and uh, this affect the uh, you know the the rating and and uh, and the appetite of everybody as well. Great, Scott. Should we come to you? Thoughts? Sure. I think on and you know it all comes down to to cash flow, and I think at a cash flow basis, um, uh, hotels and a good hotel will still do well this year. We'll still have you know probably flat to slightly up in in NOI or EBITDA, um, and I think transactions will will. Will grow this year. I think you'll you'll. I think I agree with uh, with Charles's estimate that it should be back to to those levels. And I think we'll we'll see some interesting interesting transactions. Not necessarily distressed though, but but interesting value add transactions as well as just interesting um, good hotels to acquire. Louise, thoughts? You. Um, no, I agree. I think it'll be a good year. Um, I also agree with what David was saying that I think there's a lack of supply coming in. So actually, of course, for the next couple of years, it should be positive movement. We very much enjoy doing development finance. It's one of our passions. And we haven't seen the development projects come forward. So I agree that there would be limited stock coming into the market. Yeah, Ramsey again, positive for 2024. Or... I, I think very good year for transactions. Um, just good opportunities coming up. I think in terms of performance, it really varies by market, but overall positive. There's, there's nothing really negative out there in terms of hotel performance. Katie? Yeah, pretty much agree with everyone again. Um, I think uh, trading, you know, you've got to, you've got to keep a handle on costs um, and, and there will be people who do that very well and equally there will be people who are unable to kind of do that so well. Um, I think it will whatever sort of happens i think it will translate into a into a busy year for transactions 
again, I agree with Scott that that doesn't necessarily mean they'll all be distressed. Um, and if there are turnaround stories, you know, investors have got to be really clear as to how they're going to execute those in the, you know, in the context of the cost environment. Um, but I think, um, yeah, I think it will be an interesting year. Neil, Neil, finally, wrap up for us. Uh, look, yeah, I, I think I think everyone's clear that there's going to be more transactions happening in 2024. Um, whether those are driven by distress, bank refinancing, who knows? Um, I would flip it all in its head and say 2024 is all going to be about keeping discipline in underwriting and operational performance because we're coming out of a period where RevPAR growth hit a multitude of sins and challenges. So for, for us, it's all about operational diligence. And if we get that right, we can translate that into, into underperforming assets. And if we get that right, we do good cash yields. If we get that right, we'll get a good valuation and we'll be able to buy for decent prices. But it really depends what everyone else wants to pay in the market because you know we keep talking about all these other people who've got money raised that they need to deploy before it, it expires, which will make life difficult for people like us who are buying not to use up commitments but to um create long-term returns so that's going to be the challenge the biggest challenge for us not distress or performance great thanks Neil. and um i think that's really positive that all six of you are, are positive out the market when graham said he was positive as an insolvency practitioner i wasn't quite sure what he meant by that but um i think generally there does seem to be a lot of positive sentiments about both the transactional market and clearly some challenges on on performance um so with that um can i say thank you very much to my panel um, for your insights and thoughts. And I will say goodbye from Sunny Warsaw and hand over to Karen. Thank you very much, James. Um, just to do a very quick wrap um, on today's webinar with some um, points that I picked up from a personal um, point of view, really, uh, just a handful of these to finish. So um, the first thing I, that struck me was that, that Scott's comment really that RevPAR's normalizing there are still pressures on the bottom line, but well capexed and well located hotels will do well. And a key theme that our panelists seemed to bring out was the importance of the quality of the asset. That was very much a general theme. Neil referred to the bifurcation of assets. That must be the uh, word of the day, I think, into those which are fit for purpose and those which are not. And that's whether it's a business hotel or one where the hotel might be the focal point of a trip, for example. And Neil commented again, debt just makes it more transparent as to how an asset is performing. So our panelists were bringing out again, the theme that pressure here is on managing operational risks, operate well and drive results, but debt won't change your operational performance unless for example, you're approaching a, a refinancing cliff. That was another one of, of Neil's comments. On loan to value points, debt serviceability is more of a focus than value. That very much came through. And Katie commented on behalf of the banks that cash flow very much drives lending decisions. On the million dollar question, will we, we, will we be seeing more deals this year? I liked Ramsey's comments that we are seeing normal cyclical pressures here, in his opinion, such as inflation, but no major post-COVID shakeout. So Ramsey's view is that we would see more deals, but not at distress levels. That will be great news for some people, but not for others, clearly. Overall, I kept hearing from our panellists that we would have a good year ahead, though, in terms of deal activity, which is good news. So on that positive note, I wanted to thank all of our um, presenters and speakers today for their insights. And thanks to all of you who dialed in. This was, in fact, the 19th of these webinars that Bird and Bird have co-hosted with EP, HBS and Alex Partners. And so our next one will be our special 20th anniversary edition. We are going to be hosting that in May. So please look out for more information on that. And if you do have any thoughts as to topics that you would like to see us cover in the 20th anniversary edition, then please do um, message me or Russell or Graham. But for now, thank you very much. And thanks for dialing in. And thanks again to everyone who presented and spoke today. <laughs>